Hello everybody, this is a quick message before we get into this video. This video was originally filmed as one long video, but we've decided to split it up into smaller parts. What you're watching now is part one, so at the end of this video, don't forget to go and watch all the other parts. The videos in this series will contain things that many of you might find upsetting or triggering. We will be putting in trigger warnings before we start talking about those subjects. If those topics are difficult or triggering subjects for you, please feel free to skip through until it's at a non-triggering point. These videos are very very raw and we have decided to share this because we want to be giving as authentic and honest a view into our experience of DID and how adult DID systems use their dissociative identity disorder and the way that the brain has developed to handle extremely traumatizing situations, especially crisis situations like we were going through in 2020 and 2021. We've shown videos where we've got upset before, we've been triggered on live streams and things like that, so it's not like this will be the first insight that you will see into a DID system dealing with their triggers and trauma. You will see us cry in this video because we needed to cry to get through it, but also because sometimes the only times we can talk about certain things is when we are extremely dissociated from them. And that's our brain protecting us. But other times, this can be how difficult it can be just to say a couple of words. And I think that that's important to share as well. The last thing I wanted to say before we go into this is that every person's experience is different. Every system's trauma will be different, every person's trauma will be different. And even if two systems went through the exact same trauma, those two systems could still deal with it completely differently and show and present completely different symptoms. This is not the right or only way to handle trauma. This is just our experience and we are sharing it with you because we want to destigmatize our disorder and help other people who may feel like they're the only ones. You're not the only ones. If we can make it through this stuff, you can make it through whatever you're going through as well. So with that said, please take care of yourselves, be responsible for your own triggers, but enjoy the videos. Hello everybody, welcome back to another video by Dissociated. This is gonna be a system update. Don't worry, there will be more Meet the Alters videos coming where Alters introduce themselves as themselves, and there may also be a sort of block of those of like Meet Another Six or something like that. But this is a system update where I'm gonna tell you who is still in the system, who's not in the system, who's split, who's fused, who's new, some of the story behind why some of the alters that were in a system are either not in it anymore or different now and give you like a little pre-introduction to some of us. Okay, so, oh my god, <laughs> this is like the fourth, fifth time I've tried to film this video, so bear with. <laughs> We'll see how successful it is. These are gonna be in no particular order, not only because I'm not entirely sure what the order is. This isn't like the order that splits or fusions or anything happen. It's just easier this way. Before we get started, the first thing I wanna explain really briefly is fusion and integration. So integration is anything to do with moving towards breaking down amnesia barriers in the brain and increasing things like communication within their system and between their alters. It's a step towards healing, a step towards fluidity, is generally a really positive thing. Back a few years ago, I only knew of the term integration, and integration was used to describe what we now know to be fusing. I hadn't seen that word used in the community at that point, and sometimes we still use the two phrases interchangeably, but we try very hard to use fusion when we mean fusion. So fusion is a type of integration, and it is when two or more alters fuse together, blend together, if you will, to create one new alter. It's essentially the disruption and dismantling of those amnesia barriers that makes two alters separate, so that their memories, awarenesses, experiences combine to create somebody new, somebody different who has a mixture of those experiences and memories, may not have all of those memories, but is their own new person, while still retaining the experiences, memories, and lives of being the previous two or more alters. We've previously compared it to gem fusions in Steven Universe, it's a pretty similar thing. They're both still there in that person, but they're new now. It's gonna be a heavy video. <laughs> I'm gonna do this this time. This is the last attempt and if it doesn't happen now, it's gonna happen now. So the easiest thing to start with would be me. So if you were here pre-2021, pre 2022, then you will have known Nin to be the host. A quick rundown of who I've been, right? My name is Kaya, 
I'm the integration fusion of Kyle, our previous primary protector, and Nin, our previous host. How did they come about? So Kyle was around since the body was like three years old-ish, is when his first memory was set at. Then we had our host, Chloe. Chloe fused with Nina, our sexual protector, to make Nin, and then Nin fused with Kyle to make me, Kaya. So if you're wondering where Nin or Kyle are, it's me. Hi. So how come Kyle and Nin fused? It was a mixture of trauma and being forced to rely on each other in a way that amplified an already very deep and meaningful relationship that we had, which wasn't a defined relationship, it was very deep. Because Kyle was primary protector of the system, he'd grown up with Chloe and then Nin, and uh, was very, very protective of her. Because he was primary protector again, he was first port of call for Chloe and Nin. He was the person that I was most familiar with in the system, and we were already by that point very, very close. But then we had a trauma that overlapped with each other that affected the two of us more than it affected the rest of the system, and we began to really rely on each other, and we became very interconnected. We found some peace through that. We managed to heal some of the trauma through our relationship with each other. So what the hell am I talking about? I'll give you a proper explanation. Nin and Kyle were the most hurt by the ending of a relationship with our, at the time, fiance in 2020. There were multiple relationships between the systems, but between Kyle and Nin and their system, there were three romantic relationships. There were also a load of other relationships between them and the rest of our system, including very, very close personal relationships with protectors, recovering persecutors, and almost familial type bonds with their littles and our littles. We were engaged to be married, and we were going to be getting married a couple of months after when the breakup happened. Stay with it. Our lives at that point had been very intrinsically bound together. They were going to move from their country to our country, booked and bought things for the wedding, moved into a house that was going to be our family home. A lot of their stuff was with us. We were fully dedicated to having a life together and a lot of incredibly complex relationships between the many altars in our system and the many altars in theirs. Kyle and Nin fought about ending the relationship and what would be the best way to end the relationship and how many of those relationships should be affected. Kyle was very frustrated because his partner wasn't involved in any of the issues and if he had had his own body, he would have got to keep his relationship and had his happy ever after. But because we're systems, system responsibility is a thing and all the altars come in one body. In the end, we did end all the relationships between our two systems, which was obviously difficult for all of our system, but more so for Kyle and Nin, because they were the ones out most often, they were the ones who interacted most often, they were the ones who had romantic relationships, and, um... I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna do it! I am not gonna do it. Okay. In the end, we did end every relationship between our systems, and it was the last straw for their system. Nin blamed herself when she was told that it was the last straw for them, and she was absolutely wrecked with... A kind of survivor's guilt Fuck, come on. that I still struggle with. I don't want to ruin my makeup. I'm not even like two minutes in, for fuck's sake. Ah. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the crux of it is, is that Nin felt like she was able to survive that situation, barely, to be fair, whereas uh, their partner at the time couldn't. I think that the trauma that happened around that aspect of stuff, the primarily relationship stuff and the emotions of it and the pain it caused is probably one of the reasons why I, as Kaya now, am asexual and aromantic. I think that that was our brain trying to protect us from anything like that ever happening again. Which makes sense to me. Kyle and Nin found comfort and closeness in each other and began to be essentially completely inseparable. One couldn't front without the other. They were only happy when they were together, talking to each other or doing an activity together, whether that be like reading a book together, co-con. They had an extremely deep and undefined love for each other. 
The trust that Nin and Kyle had is nothing like anything any of us have ever experienced in any other aspect of our life or with anybody else. It was the most intrinsic, deep and healing relationship any of us have ever had. Soon, um, one ceased to exist without the other and I became who I am now, Kaya. It took many, many months and we weren't aware of it. And then when we did figure out what was happening, we were at first very, very, very upset because we didn't want to be without each other. My God. <laughs> and um, we were worried for the system because that means that the system would have to adjust to a big change, a host and a primary protector being gone or changed. And I, I didn't know whether I was going to be able to do both jobs. I can't, I'm the host, but I do have a lot of uh, protector and primary protector responsibilities, but I couldn't do the whole of Kyle's job and host at the same time. It's just too much. I can't be inside and outside simultaneously. So we were worried about that. Somebody asked me what her name was and it just came to me, Kaya. I just knew it. And at that point I had a name before I was fully me. It was kind of like a Venn diagram with like three circles and it was like it was an extremely complex thing to fuse in that way. Most of our other fusions have been relatively quick. That was not. Other things in, in 2020. We discovered and split a whole load of new littles and teenage alters in 2020. The 2020 trauma forced us into applying words to trauma we'd experienced that we had been unable to look at. The weird thing is, is that we can talk a lot easily, but without being dragged down into it at least some of the time about really traumatic stuff like being kidnapped and being raped and water torture and, and things like that and some of those things we can just talk about it like it's a fact because it is because we're so or at least some of us are so emotionally removed and associated from the experience that it feels like watching back a movie that doesn't mean that it's easy to deal with or that it's not traumatizing or that we don't have flashbacks and that it doesn't hurt because it does but there are other traumas that we've experienced that it's so hard. It's hard to even look at it, let alone like put words to it. It's one of those things where like, even if it comes up in the, like, the tiniest back of your mind, it's like I am running from it as far and as fast as I can before it can catch up to me because I can't go anywhere near it. The 2020 traumas forced us into looking at it. And uh, because of that, we discovered um, some alters that had been there for a while that we weren't aware of. Sorry, in order to get this done, I'm gonna have to cry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just bear with. It's gonna ruin my makeup though. So uh, there are some things that are harder to look at or name than others to accept. And in order to accept something, sometimes you've got to put a name to it. Some of those things were CSA, um, Coxa, and um, being victims. This is something I've never said online. Wow. Or to anyone except the therapist, I think, and a couple of friends, but... Um, Jesus. We were <sighs> child porn or sexual ch child porn or child sexual exploitation media CSM. So as you can imagine, some of that stuff is buried quite deep and there are more words and more phrases that are more specific. And I don't think that I will ever be able to use those words or look at them. <sighs> You're okay. I'm not having flashback, I'm just upset. It's hard.
Okay. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. In 2020, we were forced into confronting that trauma which we weren't ready to do. And because we were forced into applying the reality of it to ourselves, we discovered new altars and split some more because of the extremely re-traumatizing way that we were forced to look at it. And because of that, it meant that we were forced to face not only that kind of abuse in our, in our past, but also how that would impact our future. We're still struggling with it, obviously. <laughs> um, it's a returning topic in therapy for us. We're working on it. Um, but that was the start of us having to accept some of it, which I guess will be a positive thing in the long run. I'm not gonna name those altars. I don't know the names of a lot of them. I don't have a lot to do with many of them, but there are some that have been around a while and some that split from the re-traumatization of being forced to look at it before we were ready and the way we were forced into looking at it.